And we're on Revelation Road. Amen. Speaking of Revelation Road, how do you like my shirt, man? I win. I win. And then on the back there, it's got Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. I don't know if the camera could pick that up, but I had to advertise that real quick, Flo. And you can get yours at BenjaminFaircloth.com. Amen. So make sure that goes on the YouTube, Joshua. We'll do a little bit of modeling and advertisement. Somebody says, put, the, put it back on. Put, this, put the jacket back on. But anyways, I win. I win. Don't you? Yeah, we're winners in Christ. He's providing for us. He already made a way. All right, Revelation Road. I'm excited about all this teaching because we're coming uh, <clears throat> to the end. And what I mean by that is not the end of the teaching. It's the end of, of, of seeing where we're headed. And the revelation is of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the goal, amen? That's uh, what we're all uh, waiting for and looking for, uh, our redemption. So, <clears throat> Revelation, revelation Road, last time we got together, we was in chapter 17. And I'm, I'm going to, let's see, how am I going to do this? I'm going to really take my time on this because I, I, I want to teach in a way that really gives you a deeper understanding because of the nature of what we're getting into here. And it can be a little confusing, and I don't want to do that. I want to, want to go slow so you can kind of, kind of pick up everything. So uh, I hope you appreciate that. I wish I had my writing board with the camera thing. We don't have that just yet. Uh, so we're going to uh, try to bring you into uh, some, some graphs up here on the, on the, uh, on the uh, camera and on the uh, YouTube there on the live stream so you can kind of see it. So but anyways, chapter 17, verse 1. Remember, this is a flashback chapter, and God fills in the gaps. He shows us things that we, we don't quite understand. And again, you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be ordained. You don't have to be any of those things. Just what you have to do is be a student and then ask the Holy Spirit to help you. So he does that with this particular chapter. Verse 1, it speaks of the seventh angel. Okay? Okay. Uh, Remember the assignment that's already been, already been completed. We saw that in chapter 16, verse 17. It shows you the judgment of the great whore. Remember that prostitute, that name is a, a porneo or, or porne for porn, pornography, porno. So uh, very, very interesting. It means sexual encounters, but it also means idolatry. So it goes hand in hand that when you see idolatry <clears throat> or fornication, to God, that's what it is. Anytime you serve any other God, to him, it's idolatry. To him, it's fornication. And so uh, we, we talked about that. We talked about Nimrod's kingdom. It's, and it's very important that we go back to the beginning. We go back to these things because I'm going to show you some teaching tonight that uh, <clears throat> a lot of people have the various views but I think the safest view and the safest way is to go back to the garden, go back to the rebellion of Nimrod, go back to the beginning of Babylon, and then you can see from that particular point of rebellion uh, the, the craftiness of the enemy and how the, Satan has always wanted to capture the mind and the heart of man and to harness the power of man to fulfill his goal because he can't do it on his own. He doesn't have the ability to do it on his own, okay? So he has to use man. So we talked about that. We're not going to go back over all that again with Nimrod and those things because uh, I think I've already gone over that uh, very well. We talked about uh, uh, being on many waters and uh, how that represents people and how that this particular whore sits upon many waters. She's all over the place. And that spirit is all over the place. We talked about uh, verse 2, idolatry. Now go to verse 3. I think what I'm going to do is pick up on verse 3. Uh, and, and then this is going to be some of the, the recap. But I want to teach something fresh from that perspective. Can we do that? So verse 3. <clears throat> and so he carried me away into the spirit, in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. A scarlet-covered beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads 
and ten horns. So notice he goes into the wilderness or to a desolate place. Some, some guys, some teachers, what have you, will say, you know, it, it represents a desert, so it has to be the Middle East, has to be this or that. Okay, it's, you know, it's fine if you want to say that as far as wilderness, but it also could represent a place of being desolate. Uh, anywhere this whore is going to be is desolate, wouldn't you say? It, it, she, you know, it's, she's not going to be uh, you know, uh, somewhere in righteousness. And I saw a woman sit upon the scarlet of the beast. So we know that the beast is going to be colored just about the way she is. Now, I want you to recognize this because I didn't teach this last time. She's covered in scarlet as well, isn't she? So she is and so is the beast. What that shows you is that they're so intertwined. They're so intertwined. They're so together. They they actually bleed into each other, if you will. And you can't have one without the other. So that's a very interesting thought. So keep that in your mind. So full of the names of blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns, which we're going to get into more about that shortly. Okay? So we go to the next verse. All right, so we talked about the blasphemies, right? <clears throat> and the woman was arrayed in purple, and then what? Scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So she's in that color, she's in that uh, royalty, she's in that beauty, and she has the gold and precious stones and pearls. These are gifts, these aren't things she's earned. These aren't things she's going out and got a job for. She, she's, she's a prostitute, but her prostitution, she gets, she gets the gold. She gets the, the, the lavished uh, gifts upon her. Okay, There's something I want you to see as well. She's not only a prostitute, she's a queen. So she's a queen and a prostitute. So you want to write that down in your notes. I didn't go over that too much last time. So she's a queen and she's also a prostitute. It's kind of an oxymoron here. How could you be a, a queen of royalty, but yet you're, you're sleazy? You're, you know what I mean? You're, you're a prostitute, but that's what she is. So in other words, she can have a form of diplomacy, but she'll lay down with anything and everything to get what she wants. What's that? Oh, <laughs> okay. For, oh, America. Yeah, thank you. That's right. All right, so decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and the filthiness of fornication. So in this cup, so think about this cup, how putrid it must be. It's gold, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? I've always said everything that glitters isn't God. They always say well, everything that glitters isn't gold, but everything that glitters isn't God. And, and church you know, wants to say that God is here and God is there and God is with us and whatever, just because you glitter. You glow, you, you, have, you, know, you look so wonderful. No, no. God is where righteousness is and where his word is. So it's full of this, all right? So let's go to the next verse. <clears throat> and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. So we talked about this. Notice how it's in capital letters. It's very bold. And then it's put on the forehead. And I used that illustration last time of not a little nameplate, but on the forehead. That's very important because most of us, you know, we don't don't look down and say, look at your, hello, my name is whatever. But if you put a a name on somebody's forehead, would you recognize that? I think I would. I think I would recognize your name quicker on your forehead than I would there. It just also means, means going forward. That name is there. In other words, it's obvious. It's a billboard, okay? This woman is absolutely nasty. Again, it's not a person. It's an entity as far as a system's concerned. All right? So we went over this about Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So she's given birth to these other harlots. Some teach that, that it's, it's, it's more singular, but I think it's more plural, because the way I'm going to approach this and, and bring you to this revelation is, is this, that this system has been at work for all of these centuries, for all these years. Satan has been using this entity, has been using this system, and has been giving birth to this spirit. And it's gone across the face of the earth. I don't believe that it's one particular spot per se. I believe it is, it is all over the earth. And, 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 and I'll bring that into more clarity 
uh, as we go along, okay? So the next verse. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and I saw her, and I, was, I wondered with great <clears throat> admiration. Okay, now before I get to there, I need to actually go back and uh, just mention again the three systems. Remember the Babylonian, which dealt with religion, the beast system dealt with money and finances, you know, the economy type of thing, and then a world type of system. Okay, so we've got to remember that because that's the delivery system, all right? We talked about her, uh, what, what she was wearing and those type of things. By the way, in, in a little tidbit of information, this right here, talking about the whore of Babylon, verse, chapter 17 and verse, uh, chapter 18, is the longest prophecy in the New Testament. Nowhere else in the New Testament is there a prophecy about a particular entity uh, a particular person, a particular event than right here in the New Testament. I believe that God has a big deal with this, don't you? He's got a huge issue because, again, this is the culmination. This is the total fulfillment of everything that began in the garden, that happened through Nimrod, that happened through the centuries, that's happening even today. And God has said, I'm going to deal with this because you have done so much destruction to my creation and to my church. Okay. I shared with you as well last time that I don't believe, again, this is one particular place like Rome. Many people say it's Rome. It's the Catholic Church. What I believe, and I'm going to get into uh, the totality of that by the end of this teaching today, is that it is, it's a plethora. She's the mother of harlots. So in other words, there is a dis- distribution, if you will, of the spirit that goes out to all these different entities that are anti-Christ and anti-God. Is there a, a, a mother of it? Yes. The mother of it is idolatry. The mother of it is, is the devil himself. Is there a particular political powerhouse entity that can fit this bill that is kind of like the driver behind it? Yes. You can look at Catholicism at that and the Catholic Church, the Vatican. There's so much there. But what I want to get away from is the common teaching today that puts it all on the Vatican's back and all those different things without looking at the totality and seeing it bigger than what it is. Is that making sense? In other words, Babylon's bigger than Rome. Babylon is bigger than one particular religious entity. You have so many other entities that are out there, and you're going to see this clearly when I'm finished. You have Hinduism. You have atheism. You have Islam. The second largest religion in the world is Islam. The number one religion in the world is Christianity. When you consider Christianity mixed in with Catholicism, that's how the world views it. Uh, It's it's about a, it's it's close. It's a close second. Islam is. So you look at that. You look at all the other religions that are out there. Then you mingle in Chrislam and you mingle in New Age and and Satanism and uh, Luciferism and so so many things that go on in the world of. uh, of religion and antichrist and anti-Christianity, it is absolutely a, an amazing a mass amount of people on the earth today that are going to be harnessed by this devil, by this harlot. So does that make sense? It, you, you have a driver, but the vehicle is, is, is much larger than, than, than one particular entity. Again, I will, I will bring that a little more clear in just a minute, because all of our teaching for most of us in our commentaries puts it all on Rome, and, and I think it's, it's much bigger than that, okay? So we talked a little bit about that. We talked about the mystery, again, being shut up. It's being held up. It's being kept secret until this day. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is take you into verse 6 here. And it's drunken. Let's go back and look at it again. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Okay, here's why I say what I say concerning the harlot and concerning that system, that it's not just one entity. There's no doubt about it. The the false prophet will come out of the Vatican. It will come out of Rome. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it that there's no other religious 
political powerhouse in the world that could get everybody to the table than the Vatican. It's been proven time and time again, whether it's presidents, premiers, uh, prime ministers, it does not matter. They have the ability to bring people to the table. They can bring laws to the table. They can bring armies to the table. They can change things. They've done it. They've done it over the, over the years. It's a very amazing powerhouse. There's no doubt about it. So there has to be somebody, again, that steers that thing. All right? But there's more to it. Let me show you this. And I saw, go back, say there. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Everybody say saints. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, why is there a division between the two? Why is there a division between the two? Why are you saying saints and then saying the blood of martyrs? Because I believe it's speaking of Old Testament saints. And saints is used in the Old Testament in a few places. But really the word there in, in the Hebrew means sanctified ones or holy ones. Okay? So he, he classifies two groups here for a reason. He didn't say it to, for double enunciation. He did it on purpose. So I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Now, Catholicism was, uh, you know, it, it was, was not an ancient religion per se, Islam was, was developed in the, or founded in the 7th century. Uh, so, so what we're saying is, when you look at this total picture, you're talking about the blood that's been spilt since righteous Abel. You're looking at all the religiosity and the religious murders and that whole spirit of Babylon, which is just the spirit of Antichrist, whether it's named or not named, it's still the spirit of Antichrist, of all the saints who have died and were killed, and then you have the, those who are what? Martyrs, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That speaks of New Testament. So what I'm getting at is this entity is not something that just recently was born. Not something that was just recently founded uh, a few centuries ago. It is something that has been on the earth all along, and we're going to show that as we go further in that proof. Does that make sense? Have you ever saw that before? <clears throat> no, most people haven't seen that. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So she's been doing this. This whore has been doing this really since the beginning of the first religious murder, if you will. And it all goes back to Satan. It's very cut and dry. It's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. It's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Jesus as Savior, devil as the destroyer. I mean, it's very simple. And then we have the subtitles and the subcategories of Jesus, you know, the church, the disciples on, and you have the, you know, the, the, the devil, the antichrist, and the whore, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there's players on both sides. He said, I, want, I, I saw and I wondered with great admiration. So this is like totally blowing him away that he sees this thing, and I think personally he just sees it in a way he's never seen it before. And the totality of, of what this, this, this whore could do and how far-reaching it was. Okay, does that make any sense? All right, so, so as, as we move on from that, uh, he's, he's just totally, he's totally blown away. Now, let's, let's get into... Uh, a little more of Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel 7, because last time we were, we were together on this, I couldn't give it to you in totality because I just ran out of time and everything that was happening, because uh, I want to explain to you uh, what's taking place with this, okay? And it'll, it'll really build the picture a lot better. So she's drunken with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Go to, go to the next verse real quick. I think I'm not and the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now go to Daniel chapter 2, and let's read. Uh, go to Ch Daniel chapter 2, verse 32, Joshua, I think on the 35. <clears throat> I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you a few things, guys, from here. This image head, now remember, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, right? He's totally blown away. 
He, he gets his guys together, his magicians. They couldn't answer it. Uh, he wasn't going to tell them the dream. He wanted them to tell him the dream. And so Daniel's able to do it. But here's this image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. Next verse. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, and there were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Next verse. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, and the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now go to that image, Joshua, so you can see this. And we'll let the image come up here, and then it'll be on live stream and YouTube there. And then what I'll we'll do is I'll come back, uh, come back to me on the camera so I can show them a little bit about that. So this is, this is the image of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Okay, the head of gold, which is Babylon. Then you have the, uh, the, uh, the breastplate of silver, which would be Persia. Then you have the thighs of brass, which is Greece. Then you have the thighs of iron, which is Rome. And then you have the future uh, feet of iron and clay, which is divided uh, nations of Western Europe. Okay, so everybody can see that. Is it on live stream? Everybody got it? Okay, now let me just teach a little bit here because it gets very interesting. We're, we're talking about the, the, seven, the seven mountains, right? We're talking about the ten horns. We're talking about... Uh, the seven heads and this whole thing here. And, and let, me, let me try to break this down really, really easy for you. Now, traditional teaching has these, these particular nations. There's other teachings that when it comes to the legs of iron, it's actually speaking of an Islamic caliphate, an Islamic caliphate, caliphate just a whole bunch of different federations of, of Islamic nations uh, during that period of time. Then most people say that the revived Roman Empire is part of the iron and the clay feet. That's probably in most of y'all's commentaries. You've read it. You've been in uh, prophecy classes or whatever, and that's what they teach you. But there's a possibility that isn't absolutely correct. And, there, and I'm going to teach you different perspectives. And the reason why you need to know that is because it may not be as cut and dry as that. Okay? I won't go as far as to say that the legs of iron were a particular Islamic caliphate. But I will say that when you come down to the iron feet, the iron and the clay feet, that we're looking at a, a coalition, a cabal, if you will, a mixture of, of these different entities together. Uh, again, in other words, I don't think it's one specific place, but it is a plethora of places and a plethora of leaders that are going to come underneath the Antichrist. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what I want to start out with because so many people, when they teach it, they say, oh, it's a revived Roman Empire. What, what they're talking about is they're saying that the Antichrist and everything that's going to happen will come from Europe. Well, you, how many of y'all know Europe's messed up? Europe is divided. Now, all nations are messed up and all nations are pretty much well divided and the Antichrist is going to come in and fix that. But for all purposes here, it, I, I, don't, I don't think that's, that's the way this reads, especially when you look at the enemies of Israel. They're, they're not European. They are Islamic. I'm talking about Bible names. I'm talking about names that are named in prophecies in Jeremiah and other places, Ezekiel, Isaiah. They're, they're named for the region of, of the Middle East. That doesn't mean that these other entities, the United States and what have you, uh, European nations aren't involved. They are involved, okay? And so I'm just giving you different views because this is the type of teaching that's out there. Is that all right? <clears throat> so this is, this, is the, uh, this is the view. I gave you the... Uh, yeah, but going back to that blood, I want to put... Uh, this is in my notes, but I want to make sure you get this. About the drunk, being drunken with the blood of the saints and with... Uh, uh, the, the blood of the martyrs, people will say, see, that's the Catholic Church because of the Reformation. 
uh, you need to go back and follow the Islamic nations of the world and what they've done to Christians, not only Christians that are, you know, name brand Christians, Pentecostals, what have you, but also as the world looks at Catholicism as Christian, there's been many, many priests, if you will, and those in that particular uh, 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 aspect of, of Christianity that have been, been beheaded and killed by Islamic terrorism. So, so it, to say that it's all been done by Catholicism is not fair. It's not right. It's not historical. Even though there were some great things that were done against people, the Inquisition and so on and forth, so forth and the Reformation, but you also got to look at what's happened with what the Islamic nations have done. All you got to do is go look back at what ISIS has done in just recent years. Okay? Anybody that wasn't a part of Islam was, was killed. And then uh, all this happening in Africa, it goes on and on and on. So I want you to have a a broader picture than what our Bible prophecy teachers have done in the past and just laid it on one group and said, this is what it is. And then you accept it over the years. Well, you got to think beyond that. you got to look at this thing a little differently. Is that, is that make, making any sense? Okay. It does when you start to look at here at these particular uh, these entities. All right. So uh, you can go ahead and get out of that there. And then go to chapter 7. So this is traditional, like I say, especially the two last parts. But the main thing I want to focus on the feet. I think there's, 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 there's more to that than saying it's a revived Roman Empire. I think, it's, I think it's beyond that. Okay? Remember this. Remember this. <clears throat> I try not to get ahead of myself because there's so much information. And I get real excited. And I look at that clock and I'm like, I'm running out of time. Islam... Is, is the sword. Islam is the sword. Islam is the executionary, executioner, if you will. That, that's the one. That's, 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 that's the, 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 the hustle behind the muscle. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There has to be somebody who brings that federation, that coalition of nations into some type of caliphate, some type of order. We, we, we started to see it with ISIS, fell apart. We're starting to see it now rise up with Afghanistan. Turkey is a big player in this. So, but we don't have a central figure of a person who can bring them all together. Is that making sense? But the Antichrist will. Let me give you a great example. I've been to at least six uh, nations within the continent of Africa. I love Africa. I'd go there tomorrow, and it's, I love Africa. It's a beautiful place. People are just wonderful. But one thing about Africa is, even though it's so beautiful, it's so fragmented as a continent. If they would ever, and I've said this for years, if they'd ever unite, they would be such a tremendous force on the earth. But they're not, and they won't. They're just divided through tribal reasons, through influences of foreign governments. It's just chaotic. But that's the way it is. So they're separate as nations, but the continent could be really powerful. That's how I view this whole thing with Islam. Islam, if it just had that leadership, it could be that driving force. It doesn't have it yet. It will through the Antichrist. It doesn't have the political lore or the political draw that what the Vatican has. Are you following me so far? The Vatican, the Vatican, which is a nation within a nation, has its own diplomacy, has its own passports, has its own uh, diplomacy and power and all these different things. That's another uh, muscle behind the, behind the hustle there. And so you have the sword of Islam. Then you have the religious political side that can bring the t people to the table. And so you put it all together in one big cabal, you can begin to see this picture. You have the beast, which is the Antichrist, and you have this whore system that is made up of all the religions of the world that is totally anti-God, anti-Christianity, anti-Christ, moving for one particular reason. Is that making, making a little more sense? So that's why I say if you just go patent old way of teaching, you'll be locked to one entity, one particular nation, one view, 
And the world is not trending that way. The world is trending the way I'm telling you. Can it all change tomorrow? Absolutely. All of a sudden, the nations of the Islamic world can just galvanize each other and be so strong and, and to be a force to reckon with. But right now, it's, it's not that way. They're divided. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's go now to um, Daniel chapter 7. Let's see another aspect of this. Is this, is this good? Okay, all right. I just want to make sure. The spaghetti isn't making you sleepy yet. <laughs> okay, so I'm um, sorry, go to verse, uh, yeah, verse 1. Now this is, this is the, the vision now. Daniel has a vision. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dream, and he told, he told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens uh, strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made uh, stand upon the feet as of a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like unto a bear, and had raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth and of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. I wouldn't call this a dream. I call it a nightmare, by the way. And this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, a, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and had ten horns. Okay, verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth <clears throat> speaking great words. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is, this is pretty wild dream, isn't it? Wild, a wild vision, I should say. Well, what he's actually seeing is what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar saw in his particular dream. And it all comes together, and it gets overlaid for what's going to take place in the book of Revelation. And that's why we're, we're showing you this, okay? It, it, it's very, very, very amazing. Now, to, to bring you into understanding of those, those seven heads, <clears throat> go to verse 9, Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. Did we do 8 yet? Yeah, I'll go back to 8. Yeah, let's look at this real quick. Here we go. You've got to really pay attention. Give, give me just this, this time here. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Remember that. Follow me with this. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall descend out of the bottomless pit. So this beast existed. Watch this. He was, right? Is that what it says? He's not no more, and he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So he had life at one time. Remember, follow the trail of the garden, the fall of man, the whole nine yards of Nimrod, Babylon, Israel's rebellion, the nations of the world, you know, all this cabal of stuff to bring about the spirit of Antichrist. Watch. He's going to go into perdition, Right? That's right. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. Okay? So there's going to be this rebirth, if you will. Remember the feet, the ten nations, the ten toes? They call it revived, whatever. Well, it is a type of revived. We just don't know exactly the, what, what, what it's going to be. Again, we don't 
I don't teach and don't believe it's revived Roman Empire, but there is a reviving, no doubt, of that spirit of Babylon. I think that's the best way to teach it. It is a spirit of Babylon. It's rising. It was. It is not. It's going to go into perdition. Okay? But, it, but yet is. It's kind of a little of a mystery, right? The Bible explains itself. You just have to take your time and, and don't get bogged down with it. Next verse. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. In other words, you want to understand it? Ask for wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, let me teach real quick this because this is out there and you need to hear it. Some people teach that speaks of Rome. The seven hills. The seven mountains. Okay? That's what some teach. We've heard that probably all of our lives. I, I, don't, I don't believe that that's what it's speaking about because it, it, the Bible explains itself. Here's another teaching that's out there. I told you the seven mountains teaching, that those deal with, you know, the pinnacles of success in, in America and, and in life in general, you know, uh, the mountaintop of economy, the mountaintop of politics, the mountaintop of sports and entertainment. <clears throat> I don't believe that's what it's speaking of. There's another teaching that this deals with the seven hills of Washington, D.C. Let me give them to you. Capitol Hill, uh, Meridian Hill, Floral Hills, Forest Hills, Hillbrook, Hillcrest, and Knox Hill. The seven hills that Washington, D.C. is built upon. That's what another teaching is that's out there. Okay? So we have the Catholic Church. We have the Washington, D.C., we have the seven mountain teaching. Do you see how vast it is now? Okay. And it's all out there. Here's another teaching. Most people don't know this, but in the 19th century, the place where Washington, D.C. was founded and birthed used to be called Rome. It used to be called Rome. It's, it's where D.C. is now as a capital. So people put that together and say, see, 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 see. It's speaking of the United States. It's speaking of... Uh, those seven hills, okay? I do not believe it's speaking of that. And, and I won't, I'm not going to argue with anybody because there's a lot of passion out there. Some people believe that that seven mountains represents seven presidents, meaning U.S. presidents. Uh, again, it, that's, it, it's okay to look at it that way and, and, and try to figure it out, but I think the Bible begins to interpret itself, Okay. So was that kind enough? I'm being kind to every view, but you need to know those views are out there. Uh, most of you have heard these views grow, growing up in church, especially about the Catholic Church. So what happens is we throw just a few subjects I've mentioned already. We've thrown everything on the Vatican. And we let all these other entities get away. And then we, we miss the small picture. I mean, that, that's a small picture. We, we miss it, and we should see the broad picture, Okay. I like to look things simple. I like to study the Bible simple, and I like to use I like to use history and prove itself. Okay, so here we go. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads of seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So she's sitting upon what? Seven kingdoms. Seven kingdoms is what she's on. Okay. Let me give you. Uh, because this, this is, this is going to, well, let's go to the next verse, because this is going to blow you away. All right, next verse. <clears throat> and there are, the, there are what? Seven kings. He just explained it. Well, there are seven mountains. It's, 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 it's Rome. Look, there are seven kings. So speaking of kings, kings have kingdoms, right? Kings have kingdoms, and kingdoms have kings. So there's seven kings. Five are fallen. One is... And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So, so let's look at this. It's like a riddle, isn't it? But it's not. It's easy to understand once you spend a little time studying. There are seven kings. So we know there were seven kingdoms. John is writing in the first century. He's writing from the perspective of the first century. So he says there are seven kings. Five are fallen. That means there must have been five kingdoms prior to his writing. Let's look at those five. It's Egypt, 
Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. That's your five. Okay? Are you with me so far? They're already gone. Those kingdoms are gone in, in, in the time of this writing. Okay? So he's explaining. He's using prophecy, but he's using historical facts too. Now watch. And when he cometh, so one is not there yet. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Next verse. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. Go back to verse 10 again. Let's explain it. And the other is not yet. So there's five that have fallen and one is. Who is the one that was? At the time of his writing, first century, it was Rome. Rome was in power. So Rome is number six. Is that correct? Yes. So after Rome, what happens? The other has not yet come. So that kingdom, the final entity, the final beast system, the final antichrist kingdom hasn't come yet. Okay? Remember, he is that little horn that comes out of the horns that Daniel saw. He is the one that's ahead of that confederacy of the iron and clay toes that Nebuchadnezzar saw. Make sense? It's, you have to hear this again and to really take your time. But, but I'll try to make it simple and, and, and better for you. So one is, speaking of Rome, and the other is not yet come. So this right here tells me, when I show you this here, it'll prove to you that it's not the Roman Empire and then the revived Roman Empire and then the, the Roman Empire again. In other words, they get three chances, three shots. Watch this. It doesn't make sense. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So the last guy is going to get a short space of time. How about three and a half years? Right? Yeah. The Antichrist is reigned. So this is what we're talking about. Next verse. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, is of the seventh and goes into the perdition. Oh, man, what's he talking about? Well, it's pretty simple. The beast that was and is not is speaking of who? The Antichrist. Even he is of the eighth. What it means is this. When he comes as that seventh entity, the Bible says that he's wounded in the head and he's dead. Is that right? Then he's revived. Now, some say, again, that's a nation. I think it's an entity. I personally believe it's speaking of a person. Some believe it's, it's, an, it's a nation. Okay, I'm not going to argue. But this entity rises from the dead. So he was the seventh, but now he's the eighth. See this? But he's a part of the seventh. So in other words, he is that original, uh, that original entity, which is the Antichrist, which is the beast. All right? And it already told us that he'd gone into perdition, right? He kept telling us, he that was and he that not, who that is, going into perdition. Coming up out of the bottomless pit, out of the abyss, and then he'll go into the in perdition, which means destruction, which means, you know, the end of him. Do you see that? So when you put this thing together, it, it becomes very clear that the seven kings, five are fallen and one is, again, speaking of Rome, and then speaking of the rule of the Antichrist. And that head is wounded, and then there's a resurrection. Again, all that is part of counterfeit to act like the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, if you will. Okay? So, so you you, you got to remember that. That deals, the eighth deals with the Antichrist. Okay? All right. So go to the next verse. <clears throat> and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. So now we have ten kings which have received no kingdom as of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So what happens is, again, we have this coalition, this federation, this cabal of these particular nations who come underneath the rule of the Antichrist. Remember, he's that little horn. He springs out of those other horns. 
right? He has the eyes of a man, and, and, and he, has, he has great power. He speaks uh, great things. He's, he blasphemies God and what have you, all right? He's full of pride. So they have no kingdom, but yet they receive power as kings f- for one hour. One hour just means a short space of time. An hour is not long, is it? <clears throat> it's not long at all. And so it's speaking of that time that he has to reign. Next verse. They have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So they have one mind. They have one purpose. Where did we hear that before about one mind? Babel. Babel. Babylon. The tower. They had one mind, one speech, one heart, one purpose, one goal. Nothing could stop them. It's that same exact spirit that was on the earth then is on the earth now. Nothing has changed. Okay, so when we see this entity rise up, again, I don't think he's coming from Western Europe or revived Roman Empire. I think it deals with a total cabal of the religions of the world. First of all, I'm speaking of the whore. Then we're speaking of the Antichrist, that beast system, uh, will, will, will be uh, strengthened by these other kings, okay? And they will have this one mind. But again, these different teachings of it being Washington and Rome, uh, I, I think is, 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 is not correct. Okay, so next verse. And let me say this. That doesn't mean they don't have a, a part in it. Absolutely have a part in it. That's where you get people that go on one side of the ditch or the other, and they just say, well, I don't believe that, so all of it, you know, I'm just going to throw it all out. No, be mature and say, hey, they're all going to have a part in this. Well, what do you think? Of course, Washington is a seedbed. Of course, we haven't even gotten into Mystery Babylon yet as a city and what we believe uh, that America is. We're just talking about this particular entity of that horse system that rides upon that powerhouse, political powerhouse. And of course, it's going to be mixed with different nations of the world, okay? All right, and these shall make war with who? The lamb, and the lamb shall overtake, overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. So we know this is talking about the battle of Armageddon, okay, which I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that does speak of the battle of Armageddon. And uh, what time? I got just another minute or two. So let me try to clean this up and, and just fill in any blanks that I can for you uh, before we go, next time we get together, because it dives into Daniel 11. Speaking of Armageddon and all those things. The main thing you need to understand and see so far is that, again, we have this whore. We have this, this entity, this system, that it's, a, that it's political, yes, in nature, but it's, it's, it's religious in nature as well. It draws men together under that spirit of Antichrist, just like Babylon did. And then you have her sit upon a powerhouse, Uh, the the entity of the beast, the Antichrist, which they work together hand in hand to draw men away from the Lord Jesus Christ, to draw men away from truth, to ultimately drive us all, meaning them, all of them towards Armageddon, okay? In describing her, this whore, this system, we see that it's not just one particular entity of religiosity, but it's, it's, I think it's the entire nation. It's the entire nation because anything that is not of God is antichrist. If you go out there and hug a tree, you're antichrist. If you think a tree is your God, you're antichrist. If you think a bug and a chair is God, you're antichrist, you're anti-God. And I think, and I believe, and I think the scriptures prove that the Antichrist will harness all of that energy and all of those belief systems into one big cabal, and that is the whore of Babylon. Again, the Babylonian system, the serpent system that began with deceiving Eve and just navigated its way all the way to this very day. And then there is a political power that is that beast in which the Antichrist controls that will come up out of the nations of the world as we've just seen. Very exciting times. Is it happening right now before our eyes? Absolutely. 
nations are taking positions. Look at uh, wars and rumors of wars that are happening all across the earth. Man is jostling. He's getting himself on, on one side or the other. And, and I believe there's, there's coming this day when this beast that was, uh, that was not but is, is going to rise up. And it's going to be that same spirit that's controlled the hearts of men and hearts of presidents throughout the ages. And then ultimately is going to possess one particular person, which will be the Antichrist. So very exciting times are ahead of us. Uh, I still got so much more on this particular chapter. I hope that helped you some. You're going to have to go back and be a Berean and really listen to what I had to say. Stop, take your notes again. But most of all, get your Bible out. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you, and he'll lead you into all truth. Father, thank you for this opportunity to minister today. Uh, I ask you to just give us clarity. There, there's, there's many game time things that are going to happen, Father, in, in the coming days. And, and the main thing is we want to be ready. We will be on your side and watching and reaping the final harvest in this last days. We love you, Father, and thank you for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I love you. I'll see you Sunday. Remember, you win. Blessings.